Runway 3, clear to land, cars for the cross on 1206. Okay, clear to land, runway 3, step charge to it. That's why it's taking the Cessna's 11 o'clock, 2.5 miles, slightly higher. Everything taught in this series is intended for virtual aviation only. While I attempt to replicate real world procedures on my channel, and so do many of you, I am not a certified flight instructor. If you want to learn to fly in the real world, you must attend a flight training program with a certified flight instructor. This series will attempt to teach and replicate real world procedures, but is not a substitution for real world training with a certified flight instructor. You have been warned. Hello YouTube, Captain Mac here and welcome back to Virtual Flight School. Now this is going to be an out of place uh, video in this series and the reason it's out of place is because <clears throat> typically we would start talking about approach charts much later in our flight training however uh, I've been talking with a friend of mine uh, does a lot of flying and I, I've actually heard from a few other people they just don't know how to read approach charts now I have a tutorial up on pr approach charts and to be quite frank with you it's not that good. In my opinion, it's not that good. Not only do I think it's not that good, but it was using Lido charts uh, from quite some time back when Navigraph was uh, was providing Lido charts, and Navigraph went back to using Jeppesen charts. And so I need one on Jeppesen charts anyway. So I decided, you know what? Um, let's go ahead, and it's going to be part of our virtual flight school anyway. So why don't we go ahead and uh, put this tutorial together now? We'll end up throwing it in there a little early, but it's good information to get out there for you all anyway. So without further ado, let's take a look at approach charts. Now, as we're about to dive into this, I would like to stress <clears throat> a couple of things here. First of all, I am no master of approach charts. The information that I'm about to give you is going to come straight from the FAA's uh, document or uh, manual. It's the chart. It's the FAA chart user's guide, is what it's called. It's uh, and it covers all different charts. We're just going through the section that covers terminal procedure publications (TPT, TPPs), uh, which includes your approach charts, <clears throat> and that's that's all we're covering right now. Now again, I'm going to pull the information from uh, the chart user's guide. However, some of the information I may not be 100% positive on, and it may be like somewhere much further down in the document or something, and maybe I just overlooked it or something like that. So I'm no master of this by any means, nor do I pretend to be. Uh, but I do know a little bit about pro approach charts. Um, I have gotten pretty used to reading them for the most part and I'm going to do the best that I can to give you as much information as possible. The other thing that I want to stress is that this is approach charts only. We will talk about VFR charts and other charts in different tutorials. This one's already going to take enough time as it is. Okay. So without further ado, let's dive into the first part of our approach chart, which is going to be uh, the margin information or margin identification information. And that's this information out here. Outside of these borders is our margin identification information. So we have a lot of different information up here, starting with the airport. All right, it's uh, Phoenix. It's usually listed as city and state or just city. So in our case, it's just the city and it's got the uh, airport uh, ICAO code KPHX. And I forget what the three letter code is. That's the IATA code, I think. Um, so it's got that on there as well. And then it's also got the name of the airport, Phoenix Sky Harbor International. Of course, I chose Phoenix because I like to choose Phoenix. It's got the date the chart was published, which was 17 April uh, of 2020 for this particular chart so this one's not that old actually uh, and then it's also got uh, so this is the chart number 11-1 if I go to my charts list over here and I go to approach charts you can see here this is the ILS localizer DME runway 7 left chart 11-1 
11-1. Down here I've got 12-1, which is the RNAV for the same runway, and you can see that's 12-1 there. So that's what this little number right here means. And then it's got the uh, uh, city and state over here, Phoenix, Arizona. So sometimes it'll be on the left, sometimes it'll be on the right. Believe it or not, you can get uh, approach charts from, you're supposed to be able to get them from the FAA. Uh, I don't remember how to do it, um, but you can get these for free. Uh, I'm just not sure if there's a digital version or not or how you go about it. Maybe it's not free, maybe it's a, a few bucks, but it doesn't cost as much as Jeppesen charts. So Jeppesen charts are going to closely follow the FAA guidelines, but they're not precise. They have a few little differences. So we've got the name of the airport over here in this case as well as the uh, ICAO and the IATA identifier and then on this side we've got the city and state and right below that we've got the type of approach. This is an ILS or a localizer DME approach for runway 7 left and we'll talk about the differences between those in a little bit. Alright now I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. You've got uh, this, this is a little bit of information that tells you what's going on here. Uh, you've got changes down here, so minimums chart format has been changed on this one. You've got Jeppesen's copyright information down here. You've got over here, if you want to spam my email, that is the email I use for Navigraph. Go ahead and try to hack it. I don't really care because I'll just change the password. <laughs> Not that I think anybody's going to do that. And then, of course, for our... Uh, for our flight simulation, we've got this big red uh, bold lettering down here, Navigraph charts intended for flight simulation only, not for navigational use. Now, in reality, if the current chart from Jeppesen, which is probably out of date by now, but if the current chart for this approach was 17 April 2020, then this chart would be applicable because the only difference between this and the chart that was actually produced on 17 April 2020 is that it's got the information over here saying it's linked to my Navigraph account and it's got uh, the big bold red letters down here and if I'm smart I'll try to remember to block that out but knowing me I'll probably forget so you might have seen it anyway okay so that's your uh, margin identification information that you're gonna find and you're gonna find it on all of your charts so if I go to this chart again this is the same runway so there you have again the uh, ICAO and IATA identifiers the name of the airport the date of publication 17 April 2020 the chart number 12-1 you got city and state and then you've got the type of approach, RNAV, and then GPS in parentheses. RNAV and GPS are the same thing. RNAV is just short for area navigation, which was what they used to call GPS. The idea was it was supposed to all go to GPS, but for some reason they just never did it. And so you keep seeing RNAV and GPS together. So this is the RNAV or GPS Y or Yankee approach for runway 7 left. And you can see that for the most part, the uh, margin information, margin identification information is the same. Okay, once we've got uh, the margin identification information covered, and that's really just to make sure that we've got the proper, uh, we're looking at the proper airport, so this, uh, this approach is for Phoenix, and that it is the approach that we want. So that information is important, as well as whether or not that chart is up to date. Now we come down to our briefing strip, and that's this first section of boxes here, and we're going to break this down into a few different sections to make it a little bit easier to understand. So you can see that I've got four different charts down here. I've got two from Phoenix and two from Schiphol in Amsterdam and all four of them are laid out the same way. Occasionally you will find some differences especially if there are a lot of frequencies or a very detailed missed approach procedure. These box, You might see two rows of uh, frequencies and so on. Okay, But to keep it as simple as possible for the most part they're going to be laid out like this one is here. So starting with the top portion or the first uh, the the top part of our briefing strip I don't know what else to call it it's called the top briefing strip on the FAA uh, in the FAA chart users guide but the charts that the FAA publishes are laid out a little bit differently than the charts published by Jeppesen so we're just going to call this our top briefing strip and this is our uh, radio communications is what this is so you've got your ATIS on here 
you've got Phoenix Approach, you've got Tower Frequencies, you can see there's two of them, and you've got two Ground Frequencies. And if we go to the RNAV Approach, again, it's the same runway, it's the same information because it's the same airport. So there's no reason the information should be different. Now this information can change a little bit if uh, you've got a really large airport with a lot of runways. You might see that uh, an approach for a different runway has some different information up here in your top briefing strip. Now if we go to this ILS approach out in Amsterdam, you can see the top briefing strip is still the same basic information. You've got your ATIS, you've got Schiphol approach, you've got Schiphol arrival, then you've got the Schiphol tower frequencies and then you've got the ground frequency and that's going to be the same for this RNP approach as well. So your top briefing strip is typically going to be, uh, well not typically, it is, in Jeppesen charts it's going to be your radio frequencies. Now there may be an extra strip of frequencies uh, depending on how many there are but uh, it's always going to start at the top with the radio frequencies and when I do my approach briefings that's where I always start right here at the top briefing strip. Alright now let's talk about our middle briefing strip that's this strip right here just below our uh, radio frequency information okay now your middle briefing strip is going to contain your approach information this this has to do with the procedure itself alright so starting over with this first box this is the localizer frequency alright for this approach now it can be the same as an approach from the other direction but that's a whole different discussion what we know for certain is that 111.5 and if there's nothing after that you assume a zero you can see 127.575 on the ATIS Okay, if that said 127.5, then we would assume that these are both zeros. Same thing here, 120.9, that's a zero. All right, so 111.50 is the localizer frequency uh, for, for the localizer on runway 7 left. Now, keep in mind, it is not a glide slope frequency. Localizer frequency is only for the lateral navigation okay and that's how that the way this is set up it's called an ILS or localizer DME approach the reason for that is an ILS or instrument landing system uses lateral navigation with the localizer using that radio frequency and it uses vertical navigation from another piece of equipment however if that piece of equipment isn't working but the localizer is you can still fly this as an instrument approach using the DME from the localizer. The localizer is located at a fixed position and you can use the DME on that and that information will be further down on the chart to land on this runway even in low visibility. All right, So just keep that in mind. The localizer and the frequency for the localizer is for that lateral navigation. It is not for the vertical navigation. Okay, And then you see IPHX here. This is the what is called the Morse code identifier. Now it doesn't give us the dots and dashes on here. Um, um, it might have it somewhere further down on the chart. I'm not sure I haven't looked to be honest with you. Um, but IPHX will be the Morse code identifier. So you would have dots and dashes, and I don't know Morse code, but you would have dots and dashes that you can hear over the navigation radio to verify that you are tuned into the proper frequency. That's why you see IPHX here, and if you go over here to Shipple, you'll see KAG here, and that would be the Morse code identifier for the ILS runway 6, or the localizer runway 6, for runway 6 in Amsterdam. All right. Now we'll go back to this chart here. And then the, and then again you have the frequency here here 111.50 and you would tune that into your navigation radio. I hope that makes sense. I didn't want to go too far down a rabbit hole on that. Next to that you have your final approach course. So this is linked to this localizer. This localizer is going to run along the runway center line, the extended runway center line from the approach end at 078 degrees. So you must be flying at 078 degrees within a certain width, uh, a certain distance left or right to be able to intercept this localizer. And off the top of my head, I do not know what the distance is, um, but I will try to look it up and get to it uh, right as we start the next portion down here. 
So this is telling you that in order to fly this approach, you must be flying at 078 degrees on your final approach. That's why it's called the final approach course. Now, this is our glide slope intercept altitude. The waypoint is named Zynga, and we'll, we'll tie this in when we uh, look further down on the chart. We'll be able to tie this in and see how this works with the uh, plan view and the profile view down below. Okay, but Zynga is the name of the waypoint where we want to intercept the glide slope. And we want to intercept it at either 2,600 feet MSL, that's mean sea level, and an easier way of thinking that is uh, above sea level. So either 2,600 feet above sea level or at 1,484 feet above ground level or AGL. And that's why it's got both of these in here. Now, above sea level or mean sea level is going to require an accurately set altimeter for the altitude to be accurate. But if you have a radio altimeter like your 737, your 777, your 747, they all have radio altimeters. And you've seen me, sometimes I will choose, uh, when we do decision altitudes, sometimes I'll choose the larger number, sometimes the smaller number because it's just easier to get to. The smaller number here is above ground level. That's using a radio altimeter. It's a system in the aircraft that sends a signal to the ground and it bounces back and tells you how far you are above the ground when you hear your call outs your uh, you know 1,000 feet uh, minimums uh, 50 40 30 20 10 all those call outs are using a radio altimeter and what that and it's just what it sounds like it's a radio signal that goes to the ground comes back to the aircraft and tells the aircraft how high above the ground you are all right and so the reason we have both of these is twofold number one not all aircraft have a radio altimeter so they may not be able to use the AGL altitude. They might have to use the MSL altitude. Also, if you've got your altimeter uh, set properly, uh, it's my understanding that this is more accurate than this. So that's why you have both of those on there. Coming over next to that, you've got your ILS decision altitude or decision height. All right, and again, we're talking about the difference between ab above sea level or mean sea level and above ground level or AGL. So the ILS decision altitude for the ILS D uh, um, ILS runway 7 left approach or localizer DME runway 7 left approach is 1,326 feet. What this is saying is that when we're flying this approach, if we cannot see the runway by the time we reach 1,326 feet, or if we can't at least clearly see the approach lights so that we know we're, on, we're still on glide slope and we know where the runway is, then we must perform a missed approach. And we'll get into that here in a couple of minutes. So you have two numbers here again. One is above sea level, 1,326 feet, and the other is a radio altitude or above ground level of 210 feet. And then next to that, we've got our airport elevation of 1,135 feet and our touchdown zone elevation of 1,116 feet. Notice that they're different. Now, in the real world, the airport elevation, uh, let me just find it here, the airport elevation is the highest point of an airport's usable runways measured in feet from mean sea level. All right, so this is 1,135 feet above sea level. Uh, this is the highest point of a usable runway, all right? Your touchdown zone elevation, on the other hand, is the highest elevation in the first 3,000 feet of the landing surface, all right? So in the first 3,000 feet of runway seven left, the highest altitude above sea level is going to be 1,116 feet. Now, before we go any further, I wanna go over the middle briefing strip at Schiphol because it's a little bit different than the one we were just looking at at Phoenix. So this is the Phoenix middle briefing strip. You've got your localizer frequency, final approach course, glide slope intercept, ILS decision altitude, airport and touchdown zone elevation. Pretty straightforward. When we go over here to Amsterdam, we've got our localizer. I said ILS on the other one. It's the localizer frequency here, localizer identifier here. We've got our final approach course, but here for glide slope, it says no altitude published. 
well why is there no altitude published well it could be a number of reasons for that it could be that uh, they they want people to intercept the glide slope at different altitudes depending on the amount of traffic coming in I don't really know why there's no altitude published except to say that this basically means that there's no specific altitude at which I must intercept the glide slope when I'm flying this approach I'm not supposed to be intercepting the glide slope prior to this altitude and this waypoint but when I'm flying this approach there are several different positions along the approach where I could intercept the glide slope this is something that you'd probably see done out somewhere like San Francisco uh, where I believe it's runways 28 left and right coming in over the bay they'll actually have pilots come in quite high and then descend relatively rapidly while they're pretty close to the runway and they'll do that even in inclement weather which means they wouldn't intercept the glide slope I don't know if they do it in inclement weather but you wouldn't intercept the glide slope until much closer to the runway than perhaps you would here for this runway 7 left approach All right let's move on a little here now now here you've got a box that says cat 3 bravo and 3 alpha ILS and then cat 2 and cat 1 ILS refer to minimums the minimums information is going to be much lower down on the chart and we'll get to that in a little while but just know that uh, what it's telling us here is that you've got you've got one two three four different categories of ILS approaches that are available using this same chart all right and that the minimums for each of these individually is going to be listed all the way down at the bottom of this chart and when we get down there we'll come back to this and go over it and then here again you see you've got airport elevation is negative 11 feet and runway elevation is negative 11 feet and because they're both below sea level you can see here it tells us that it's below sea level so you can see that the information can be a little bit different on your briefing strips so you need to make sure you're paying attention to what you're reading all right, moving on down here, I'm going to call this the lower briefing strip, and then this will be the bottom briefing strip, and that'll just help us to differentiate a little bit more. Just keep in mind that everything in this top bold box is part of the briefing strip. Now, what we're talking about here is the missed approach uh, of the uh, the uh, missed approach instructions. There's the word I'm looking for. This here works in conjunction with the ILS decision altitude. So we talked about this briefly now I want to come back to it really quick. This is the altitude at which if you cannot transition from instrument only flight to visual flight. In other words I cannot fly the approach visually when I reach this altitude then I must perform a missed approach. Now that's not the only time you're going to perform a missed approach. There are a lot of reasons. I know for myself, I've had to perform missed approaches because of AI traffic pulling out onto the runway. I've had to perform missed approaches because I was too high. And I've performed missed approaches because I was trying to grease a landing in and I floated five and a half, six thousand feet down an eight thousand foot runway and it was time to go ahead and throttle back up and try it again or I was going to run out of runway before I put the aircraft on the ground. So there could be a lot of reasons why you have to perform a missed approach but this box and this box always work in conjunction with one another in inclement weather. If you cannot continue the approach visually from this altitude then you must go to the missed approach. Now, when I brief this, I always brief it the same. If we must perform a missed approach, we're going to climb to 5,000 feet, then it's a left turn direct to the PXR VOR and hold, or as directed by ATC. It's pretty straightforward and simple, but let's break it down really quick. This is telling us step one is climb to 5,000 feet. It doesn't say anything about a turn at the moment. So we're on our final approach course of 078 degrees. And if we have to perform a missed approach, we're going to continue at 078 degrees and climb to 5,000 feet. That's it. We're not going to do anything else. Now, once we reach 5,000 feet, notice the word then. It's important the way these are worded. Climb to 5,000 feet then. Once you're at 5,000 feet, you're going to make a left turn direct to the PXR VOR and you're going to hold unless you're directed otherwise by ATC. Now this is a pretty simple and pretty straightforward missed approach and most of them are relatively simple. Some of them will have a little more complexity to them. I haven't even looked at the missed approach for this one. Let's see what it says for the RNAV approach. 
The missed approach on this one is climb to 5,000 feet, direct Uxcun, and via the 111 degree track to the IWA VOR and hold. All right, there's a little bit more going on here, isn't there? So first of all, what it, let's break it down. We're climbing to 5,000 feet. On what heading? 078 degrees. Well, where is Uxcun? That's where this lower portion or this plan portion is going to come into play. So when we get there, I'm going to try and remember in my brain to come back to this chart as well because we're going to go direct to Uxcun. Now that may be on the 078 degree track because it doesn't give us a heading. But then it says, and via the 111 degree track to the IWA VOR and hold. So what that's telling us is once we reach Uxcun, uh, and then it says, and via the 111 degree track to the IWA VOR, these should be on the same heading. And when we get to the, our portion where we look at the plan view, we'll see if in fact they really are. And you can see there's a lot more information in this strip too, so I'll have to come back over here. Looking at the ILS approach for runway 6 into Amsterdam, the missed approach on this one's relatively simple too. If you must perform a missed approach, climb on track 058. That's our final approach course. So this is telling us keep going straight to 2,000 feet. And then it just says inform ATC immediately. In other words, as soon as I make the decision that I have to perform a missed approach, the first thing I'm going to do is continue on track 058 climbing to 2,000 feet. Once I've got control of the aircraft, it, this is always important. Make sure you fly the aircraft first. Once I have control of the aircraft, I know that everything's good. Whether I'm at or approaching 2,000 feet, I'm continuing on 058. I know where I'm at, I know what's going on, I know what condition the aircraft is in. Once all of that is done, then I'm going to inform ATC. That is considered immediately. So I may be at 2,000 feet and fly another 5 miles away before I got everything the way I want it and I'm ready to talk to ATC. At that point, I will inform ATC and that is considered immediately. Now looking at this RNP approach, and we haven't really talked about RNP yet. This is required navigation performance. And there's a lot more going on here, and we're not going to dig too deep into this one because now we're just getting a little crazy. But if you guys want, we can do a little bit more advanced tutorial where we can talk more about this type of information because there's more going on with this approach than your typical ILS approach. Keep in mind, this is an RNP to runway 6. I can fly the ILS to runway 6 instead, and this chart's a little easier for me to understand. So I don't want to spend, this is already going to be a pretty long tutorial. I want to get through it, and that's why we're not going to go over everything on this approach chart. But for the missed approach, it says climb on track 058, same as the final approach course, to AM 105 and climb to 2,000 feet and then inform ATC immediately. All right. So it's telling us we're going to AM 105 on track 058, climbing to 2,000 feet. And then again, once we've got everything set, the aircraft is under control, we've got the aircraft in the condition that we want it in, then we're going to contact or inform ATC. That is your lower briefing strip. All right, uh, we still got to talk about two more things on the briefing strip. I want to start with the bottom briefing strip here, and then we'll move over and we'll talk about this box over here. All right, so this bottom briefing strip is just giving us some additional information is basically what it is. So alt altimeter is set in inches. This should be different when we're over in Amsterdam. Altimeter is set in hectopascals. HPA is hectopascals, right? So um, we call it, uh, you'll hear the term QNH. I, I have no idea what QNH stands for, um, but uh, the QNH might be 1018 as an example, whereas in inches of mercury it would be uh, 3001 or 30.01. So that's telling us that altimeter is going to be set in inches, not QNH. It gives us the transition level, which is flight level 180, and the transition altitude. It's given us these separately. I honestly don't know why. They're the same altitude. 18,000 feet is transition altitude throughout the continental United States. Now, if we go over here to Amsterdam, uh, transition level is going to be given to you by ATC. Transition altitude is 3,000 feet. So there's a reason for a difference here. And that's probably why both are listed on the other approach chart because 
quite simply, you put both in there and that's just that, right? Uh, this also tells us that the runway elevation is zero hectopascals. Uh, I don't know what that means and I don't see anything in the chart user's guide that explains why it would say runway elevation at zero hectopascals. But you notice that that's not listed on here anywhere. All right, we've also got some other information here. First of all, this tells us that DME is required. Why is DME required? because this is not just an instrument landing system approach. You may not have a glide slope available. Perhaps the equipment is out. You can still fly this approach using the localizer frequency and your DME. That's distance measuring equipment. So if I have this frequency tuned into my nav radio, my, <coughs> excuse me, hold on, let me take a drink real quick. Ah, that's the stuff. Okay. If I have this frequency tuned into my nav radio, all right, then my distance measuring equipment should automatically be reporting to me how far I am from this right here, right? So IPHX the is the the not only the Morse code identifier, but that's that's what we're calling the localizer. That's its name, right? So uh, the distance measuring equipment tells me how far I am from IPHX, from the localizer, where the beacon is being, where the radio transmission is being sent out. All right. So I must have DME equipment in order to use this approach because if the glide slope is out then I must be able to fly it as a DME, localizer DME, to runway 7 left. Okay. Next door to that, we've got a note that says VGSI and ILS glide path not coincident. And you look at that and you're scratching your head going, what on earth is it talking about? Well, don't fret too much because I'm going to tell you, and if it makes you feel better, I had to look it up too. VGSI is your visual glide slope indicator. We commonly refer to this as your Pappy lights or your Vasi lights. All right. So your visual glide slope indicator and the ILS glide path, in other words, this is the glide slope, the instrument glide slope, that little uh, diamond that you see typically when you're flying in the you know, like a Boeing 737 or 777 or whatever you've got that little magenta diamond right and when you're flying on an ILS it keeps that diamond center have you ever noticed that when you go visual on the approach and you get your pappy lights set where you've got two white and two red and you're just right and if you look at that diamond it says you're above or below the glide slope well you're not it's because the visual glide slope indicator and the glide path for the instrument landing system are not exactly the same. All right. So what can happen with this sometimes is if you're flying an ILS approach and you reach decision altitude and when and you you pop out of the clouds just before decision altitude and you've got a visual on the runway and you see your pappy lights and you see three white uh, lights and one red and you think holy crap I'm really high but I'm right on the money with the ILS. It's because the glide slope or the glide path for the ILS and the visual glide slope indicator or those pappy lights are not coincident. They don't necessarily line up or specifically they don't line up. And that's what this note right here means. Pretty straight, pretty straightforward and simple once you know it, but you have I had to look it up and you'd be surprised actually uh, where I found the best information on it was on a pilot's forum where other pilots were asking that question as well. So that's not something you're not the first one to look at that and say I have no idea what that means. Now if we look over here at our RNAV approach this is to the same runway it's the GPS Yankee approach to runway 7 left and you can see that this information box has a lot more information going on down here so let's take a look at what we have really quick our altitude is still set to inches our transition level is still 180 and our transition altitude is still 18,000 feet now we've got a lot more and a lot longer notes on here so for uncompensated barrel VNAV systems, LNAV and VNAV are not authorized below negative 17 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Fahrenheit or above 46 degrees Celsius or 114 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what an un uncompensated barrel VNAV system is. Uh, I didn't even bother to look it up, but while I'm bumping my gums here, let me see if I can figure out what that is. Okay, so for uncompensated, so barrel VNAV is an RNAV system which uses barometric altitude information from the aircraft's altimeter to compute vertical guidance for the pilot. The 
specified vertical path is typically computed between two waypoints or an angle from a single waypoint. When using Barrow VNAV guidance, the pilots should check for any temperature limitations which may result in approach restrictions. That's all it really has to say about it. So basically what this is saying here is that if our temperature is below this or above this, okay, um, then we're good I guess that's 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 the way I'm reading this right for uncompensated so this approach is for uncompensated barrel VNAV systems or no I'm sorry if you have an uncompensated barrel barrel VNAV system your LNAV and VNAV are not authorized below this temperature or above this temperature so if you're flying into Phoenix this time of year right now it's uh, just about August it's probably above 114 degrees you may not be able to fly this approach if you have an uncompensated uh, a Barrow VNAV system whatever uh, unfortunately uh, on this this uh, uh, page here this RNAV GPS approaches uh, publication from the FAA I don't see anything that says anything about compensated or uncompensated. There's a lot of information about LNAV and VNAV, um, and there's information about barrel, uh, barrel VNAV systems on here, but it does not specifically say, it's only got two blurbs on it, the one that I read to you, and, and there's one here that says barometric aiding is an inte integrity augmentation that allows a GPS system to use a non-satellite input source to provide vertical reference and reduces the number of required satellites from five to four. Barrel aiding requires four satellites in a barometric altimeter to detect an integrity anomaly. And, and it goes on for a minute, but doesn't clarify what this means. So I don't know where you find that information. If you know the answer, uh, please let us know down in the comments because we've already drug on a little too long on that. Looking at uh, note number two here, DME or DME RNP, that's required navigation performance uh, of negative 0 0.30 not authorized. Uh, so I'm assuming that that means if you're if you can't meet the required navigation performance, then it's not authorized. Again, that's not clarified. In this is one of the problems that I've found with approach charts, and some of you may have as well, is that not everything is really clarified in the publications. What it what the heck does that mean? I honestly don't know. But if I had to guess, I would say a DME. Um, with a required navigation performance of 0 .30 uh, or greater or less maybe is not authorized. All right, um, if I'm flying this, I'm probably not thinking about that anyway. Uh, number three, simultaneous approach authorized with ILS or localizer runway eight. That would be off to our left on this approach. And then number four, LNAV procedure not authorized during simultaneous operations. Um, I'm assuming that means a simultaneous approach. So I can't use the LNAV uh, feature or function of my uh, autopilot if I'm flying a simultaneous approach with somebody else on runway 8. Use of flight director or autopilot providing RNAV track guidance is required during simultaneous operations. So if there's somebody approaching on runway 8 while I'm flying into runway 7 left, I'm required to use the flight director autopilot uh, guidance system. So that's the uh, the the crosshairs on your uh, primary flight display. And then uh, vertical glide slope indicator and RNAV glide path are not coincident. We already know what that means because we just talked about that. Now real quick, just to wrap this up, let's take a look at some notes over in Schiphol. Simultaneous approaches on runway 9, 18 center, 18 right, 27 or 36 right may be executed. So there's a lot of different runways where you could have somebody flying next to you on approach. All right. Number two, when established on the ILS, maintain 160 knots until 4.0 nautical miles from KAG. That is your localizer, right? Or as directed. ILS DME reads zero at runway six threshold. So this is telling you that the uh, localizer 
equipment is located at the runway threshold so your DME should re read zero when you reach the threshold all right and so you can see there can be a lot of different comments down in here and some of them you might have to decipher especially when we're looking at stuff like I don't know what that means for sure we looked this one up which made things go a little longer on this section than I intended all right but there can be a lot of information in here and if you're not certain take the opportunity we have you know this is flight simulation Pull up Google, look it up, see what it see what it means, and I should do that more often myself. Now, unintentionally, this tutorial is certainly taking longer than I'd like for it to, but I want to make sure that I get all the information out there, so I'm going to press on as I've been doing. The last thing we're going to cover on the briefing strip is this box over here to the right, and you're going to see that there's one of these boxes in every single one of these approaches. Anytime you have any type of instrument approach, you're going to have this box over here. This is your minimum safe altitudes. All right, and so basically it's coming from the PXA, uh, PXR VOR. That's what all these arrows are pointed at, the PXR VOR. So if you are between these headings, all right, and on this side of the VOR, then you have 4,800 feet is your minimum safe altitude. If you're in this sector over here, it's 5,800 feet. And if you're in this sector over here, it's 6,200 feet. Now, this information is not only provided here, but it is provided down below as well. And I'm just going through the, uh, 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 come on, chart user's guide over here because I know I saw it in here where it talks about this. Here we go. Minimum safe altitudes. Minimum safe altitudes are published for emergency use on instrument approach charts. MSAs appear in the plan view of all instrument approach charts except on approaches for which a terminal arrival area is used. And that's a whole different story. We're not going to get into that. The MSA is based on the primary nav aid, waypoint, or, ref or airport reference point on which the instrument approach uh, procedure is pred predicated. All right, so in this case, PXR VOR is what this instrument approach procedure is predicated on, and therefore it is the reference point. Uh, the MSA depiction on the approach chart contains the identifier of the nav aid, waypoint, airport, use, or airport used to determine the altitudes. MSAs are expressed in feet above mean sea level. This is not AGL, this is MSL or above sea level. And normally have a 25 nautical mile radius. That means 25 nautical miles all the way around okay or well sorry that's circumference radius is from this point out so it's 25 nautical miles from here to here all right however this radius may be expanded to 30 nautical miles if necessary to encompass the airport landing surfaces uh, ideally a single sector altitude is established that would be like this one here one sector altitude and this is from runway 7 left all right but um, uh, let me find it here again. Uh, ideally, a single sector altitude is established and depicted on the plan view of approach charts. This is not the plan view. This is. We'll get into that in just a minute. All right. However, when necessary to obtain relief from obstructions, the area may be further sectored and as many as four minimum safe altitudes established. In this case, we have three. All right. When established, sectors may be no less than 90 degrees in spread. All right. So... 90 degrees, that's more than 90 degrees, that's more than 90 degrees. Um, and MSAs provide 1,000 feet clearance, 1,000 foot clearance over all obstructions, but do not necessarily assure acceptable navigational signal coverage. Now, I don't really know what that last part means, but basically what it's saying is uh, these have to be 90 degrees or greater. And this altitude should give you 1,000 feet of clearance above any obstructions in this sector from the Phoenix VOR out to 25 nautical miles. If we look at this one, it's from runway 7 left, 25 nautical miles out, 6,100 feet clearance. If we compare that one using runway 7 left, this would be the threshold. If we use that as our reference and compare it to this one, we can see that it's only lower than this one, and that's only by 100 feet. So we should still have clearance, right? If we go over here to uh, Amsterdam, you can see that they don't meet that 90-degree requirement here, probably because what I'm reading is FAA chart user's guide, right? So this is for uh, the United States. They must have a different uh, interpretation or a different rule on it uh, 
overseas because clearly this is not 90 degrees or more but it's still the same concept right and so this is from the uh, SPL VOR which is this one right here alright and so in this sector it's 2300 feet and everywhere else it's 1700 feet and then pretty much the same thing on here so that's the last thing we need to talk about on our briefing strip now we're ready to talk about the plan view now I know there's a ton of information that we've been covering and there's a lot more to go um, but my my thought process on this tutorial is to make sure that I give you guys uh, as, as much information as, as I can learn for myself and uh, help you guys to understand how to read these approach charts so that uh, hopefully you'll have minimal questions when looking at approach charts and won't need to look up too much yourself. Keep in mind that there are chapters listed down below so if there's something specific you're looking for I think uh, you should be able to find it there uh, hopefully without having to watch too much of what you're not interested in seeing. Okay enough about that we're going to talk about the plan view now. The plan view is the view is the portion that is located directly below the briefing strip and it's going to be the same sp same spot on all of the charts. Now notice that I left part of the briefing strip in there and that's because some of this information up here correlates directly to what we're seeing down here and while uh, I want to make sure you're able to I want to be able to compare the two we don't really need to worry about uh, our frequencies up here uh, we're pretty much done with those at this point but a lot of this information correlates down here and so I wanted to make sure we were able to uh, go back and forth without having to slide the thing up and down so the first thing I want to talk about in the plan view is actually the last thing we talked about in the briefing strip portion and that's the minimum safe altitudes you notice that I mentioned that it was in the plan view as well and you can see it very clearly here now some charts don't have it so clearly to be quite frank with you but most of the Jeppesen charts do a very good job it's in this uh, this brown color here and it centers on whatever the reference point is right so in this case it's the PXR VOR that's the reference point remember we talked about that we said those arrows are pointing at this VOR and then it's separated in the exact same sectors and then you've got the altitudes as well so it's 6200 feet here 6200 feet here this is the same as this sector so this is a quick glance but it's also on the plan view because the plan view and the profile view are where you spend probably most of your time on these charts anyway so we got 4800 here and then 5800 here and remember it goes out to 25 nautical miles and since we don't see the outer ring on it we can be sure that this blue ring here is uh, less than 25 nautical miles and we know that anyway because it says right here D20 these are all these rings are centered off of the VOR that's 20 nautical miles out and so that's the next port we're going to talk about real quick is these range rings here all right so this is using the VOR PXR VOR as its reference and you can see this is 300 degrees from from the Phoenix VOR and the back course of that would be 120 degrees 330 and 150 uh, one, uh, 180 and 360 would be right here it's just a blue arrow 30 and 210 and so on and then uh, and so this one is five nautical miles from the VOR and then it's 10 15 and 20 if we look at the RNAV or the GPS it's the same thing right so it's the Phoenix VOR you got 5 10 15 20 and then so on and it should be the same out here in Amsterdam as well 5 nautical miles 10 nautical miles 15 nautical miles and you could just make out 20 nautical miles there and we've also got the same uh, on the plan view we've got the minimum safe altitudes displayed quite clearly as well and it should be on this RNP approach as well so there you can see your minimum safe altitudes how they're displayed on the plan view so if you look at this and you say uh, that doesn't make any sense to me find those brown lines on here it gives you the uh, course inbound to the VOR and shows you the minimum safe altitude for that sector and that is the same across most charts but not necessarily all of them so just keep that in mind there are a few charts out there that do a really poor job of that okay continuing on with our plan view now keep in mind there is a lot of information on here and so I'm trying to break it down into sections so that it makes those chapters easier to navigate and the next thing I want to talk about we just talked about minimum safe altitudes now let's talk about the highest points that are in the area on the approach okay so looking up over here you can see 6200 feet is our minimum safe altitude you see this 
dark dot right here and then it says 2,652 feet. These again are going to be above sea level. This is going to be the highest point in this sector over here. Okay. Now they've got another one right here. Typically the highest point, there's only one highest point. It'll have a dark dot and then it'll have an altitude. My guess is that this one has been added in here because it's so close to this holding point here. And keep in mind that we're only climbing to 5,000 feet, which is technically below the minimum safe altitude for this sector. Remember, minimum safe altitude gives you a thousand foot clearance over all obstructions in that sector out to 25 nautical miles, right? So from here, 25 nautical miles out, somewhere in that area, there's something that is at 5,200 feet above sea level. That's why this is 6,200 feet. But for what we can see within our approach area here, right at the five nautical mile ring, there's a basically a mountain, and I've seen it there many times. I'm pretty sure this is Camelback Mountain. In fact, it's got it's a peak is at 2,652 feet. But because this is so close to the uh, uh, holding position here, that one's marked as well. You can see in this sector here, we've got some type of tower could be a radio tower or something like that that's what this symbol with the little dot means and the top of that tower is at 1575 feet over here we've got a building the top of that building is at 1750 feet there's another one right here right along the approach at 1172 feet there's a radio tower for certain out here at 1535 feet and so on and you can find these all over the approach chart the ones that are going to be most important to you are the ones that are really close to your actual approach path so here we've got at 1172 feet now it looks like it's right on the approach path it's not not going to be remember these aren't really to scale all right uh, they're sort of to scale but not quite it's not going to be that close to the approach path but it is going to be quite close and I know for a fact that it is quite close you can also see there's a you've got a mountain down here this is South Mountain I believe this is part of South Mountain here uh, and then there's a the radio towers up on top there's a bunch of them up there there's got to be 50 of them right but only one of them goes up to 3068 feet above sea level they mark the highest one they're not going to mark all of them so this is the highest building Building right here on the approach path just off the approach path but very close to the approach path for runway 8 is this building here it's the highest one along that path and that's why it's marked as well and then you've got some mountains down here as well and again the highest point here 3596 feet this is also the highest point in the entire area of the plan view and so it's got this great big arrow on it as well most of them will have it not all of them will show that arrow if we go to our RNAV or GPS chart, we're going to see a lot of the same things. Here's that tower again. Notice that the view is a little different. We're actually zoomed out just a little bit, but it's got that same highest point marked with a big arrow down here. It's got the towers and so on. It's got this same point right at that five nautical mile ring, 2,652 feet. If we go over to Amsterdam, we can see over here there's a hazard beacon at 495 feet. This big arrow tells us that this is the highest point in the area. All right. Notice there's a tower right here. That's at 479 feet, so it's not as high as that. Down over here are some other towers or structures of some sort. Okay, so this is definitely a radio tower. This is a structure of some sort. We don't necessarily know what type it is. Doesn't matter. We know that's 446 feet, 410, 410, and so on. I think you guys get the gist of it. Those are the highest points in your area. And again, this is for what's within the plan view, but. Uh, 5,800 feet. None of this comes close to 5,800 feet. Uh, but the highest, the highest obstacle in this sector here, out to 25 nautical miles, is going to be at 4,800 feet above sea level. That's why the minimum safe altitude is 5,800 feet. All right. There's just a couple of more things I want to discuss real quick, and then we're going to talk about the plan view itself, uh, the information on the waypoints, and so on. But I want to make sure I cover everything. First of all, this is an airport up here, Glendale Municipal Airport. It's telling you that it's there so that you'll have a visual on it. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, it can be used as a reporting point. It can also be used as visual reference for you. And sometimes they put them on there just so you don't land at the wrong airport. If I'd have thought about it, I'd have pulled up the chart for Seattle because there's another airport. Um, it is... Uh, 
pain field, I believe, is right along the approach path, depending on which direction you're coming from. And people have landed at the wrong airports before. So you've got an airport there. Also, other uh, navigation aids will often be shown. So we'll go to the GPS here. So here's Luke Air Force Base. Here's Goodyear Airport. Here's the Glendale Airport. Now, um, if I'm not mistaken, no, I'm mistaken. I'm wrong. Um, all right, so we're in luck, sort of. I did find Jeppesen's uh, approach chart uh, reference key, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it does mention the other airports. It doesn't say anything about the star. All that it says is that all secondary IFR and VFR airports that lie under the final approach are depicted. It doesn't say anything about why there's a star on there, if it has any significance, or anything like that. Um, but either way, um, not only will the IFR or VFR um, charts or uh, airports be depicted if they're somewhere within the uh, plan view here, but so will any VORs. And I don't know if there's any uh, on any of these other charts here. Uh, I didn't really dig through them. So this is for the holding fix here. The, this little box is just telling you that um, it's uh, it's not on here, right? So this isn't where the VOR is. This is somewhere else. Uh, but I will say this, uh, it was uh, something I mentioned a little while ago. The airport, the, uh, the airport you're approaching is to scale. So this is to scale uh, for Phoenix Airport. Uh, so that's good to know at least. Same thing here, you've got a VOR down here. This is the IWA VOR. Uh, and again, IWA VOR does not fall within this plan view, but because it's part of the missed approach procedure, they show it in a little box down here. But that basically covers uh, all the additional little tidbits you'll see on here. There's a little bit more to them, uh, you know, but nothing that's really critical for you to understand uh, as far as like what's depicted when it comes to uh, obstructions and things like that. What's important is that you know what the altitudes mean, where the highest altitudes are, and what the minimum safe altitudes are. Okay, we still got a lot more going on on our plan view here, and I was basically going down a list from the Jeppesen uh, um, uh, reference uh, whatever you want to call it reference chart or whatever that tells you what everything is and quite frankly it's just you're pretty much taken forever so I'm gonna try and simplify this a little bit we do need to understand a little bit more of what's going on here but we don't have to have every little single detail so let's go through this really quick uh, these triangles here indicate what we typically call waypoints but they're actually a f they're they're really called fixes. So these are fixes. Now in the case of this uh, ILS or localizer approach chart, these fixes are based off of a physical space. Uh, so for example, foul here is 11 nautical miles from IPHX. It's not the Phoenix VOR, it's actually the localizer. Remember IPHX is our localizer. So it does have, IPHX has DME capability. So when we're 11 nautical miles out from IPHX, and then this tells us on the 257 degree radial to the Phoenix VOR, all right, then we are at foul. Uh, actually the 257 degree radial from the Phoenix VOR, not two. That tells us that we're at this particular waypoint. Now on a RNAV or GPS approach, these these are called waypoints. I think they still refer to them as fixes, but they really are waypoints because they're not based on anything fixed on the ground. They're arbitrary spots placed in the air using the navigational ability of the GPS. So YEXI, or however you say it, or UPNU, they're not related to any specific uh, uh, navigation aid or anything like that on the ground they simply exist in the air and they can only be found via GPS you notice that there's no distance information or anything like that on these all right now with these uh, individual waypoints or fixes if you look out here Avona Avona is actually over here uh, Fowl is right here but Zynga is over here Perch is over here so when it's possible they'll always put the name right next to the fix or the waypoint I'm just gonna start calling them waypoints when possible they'll put the name right next to the waypoint but if there's not enough space they'll draw an arrow or a line from the name 
to the waypoint that it refers to. So Avona is a great example. It's actually over here. And part of the reason I bring Avona up is because this is our initial approach fix. So when you see IAF, that tells us our that's our initial approach fix. If you see IF, like you see here on Foul, that's our intermediate fix. So we've got our individual waypoints. This is our initial approach fix. This is our intermediate fix. Any transitions are going to be a slightly bold, I'm going to call it a medium line here. All right, and they will typically have the information you see between these two waypoints here. So you've got the heading between the waypoints, you've got the altitude you should be flying between the waypoints, and you've got the distance between the waypoints. The final approach course, or the approach course itself, is going to be this much heavier, or they call it a heavy weight line. It's just a bolder line that runs down the final approach course. Now there are a few more technical aspects to what you might see in the plan view, like the reason we see the GBN, which is the Gila Bend VOR, and the Phoenix VOR referencing this waypoint. Uh, for for this particular uh, uh, tutorial we're doing here, we don't really need to worry about that, except to know that this is telling us that this waypoint can be located using these two VORs, and it's pretty straightforward other than that. Uh, sometimes you'll have more than one frequency uh, located uh, on your plan view here. My brain doesn't totally want to function. It's getting a little late in the day. Um, if it's if it's a bold shadowed uh, box or oval like this one here, that tells you that this is the primary navigation aid for the approach. Um, and then any uh, any navigation aids that are related specifically to the approach. Uh, in this case, the PXR VOR is related to the approach because it's being used as a reference for foul. Uh, then that box will be, it will be boxed and it will be blue. It'll have the name of the VOR, three letter identifier, frequency, uh, the Morse code identifier, and then I don't know what the H means. I can't find it anywhere. I can't find what this stupid H means. Okay, so I'm throwing a little edit in the middle here. Um, I continued to look for this after completing the recording of this video. There can be one of three different letters located in there. It can be a T, an L, or an H, and that is the class of VOR. And depending on which class it is, it can mean something different. So for example, terminal VOR has a range of 25 nautical miles from 1,000 feet above ground level to 12,000 feet above ground level. An L or a low altitude VOR has a range of 40 nautical miles from 1000 feet AGL to 18,000 feet AGL and then the H is a high altitude VOR and it's a little bit trickier because it has several different service volumes based on altitude. The first one starts at 1000 feet AGL and goes up to 14,500 feet AGL with a range of 40 nautical miles. Uh, as you increase in altitude, so does the range. So from 14,500 feet AGL to 18,000 feet, it has a range of 100 nautical miles. And then it increases again uh, up to 130 nautical miles from 18,000 feet up to 45,000 feet. And then once you get over 45,000 feet, the range will start to decrease back down to 100 nautical miles up to 60,000 feet. So that is what that little letter actually means in there. Yeah, even though like it's it's on the Jeppesen cheat sheet over here, but I still it, it it doesn't show what the H means, but it does tell us that the D means that it works with distance measuring equipment. Now, you will have some times where you have more than one VOR. Uh, this is an NDB. Again, here the VOR, the Schiphol VOR is being used as a reference here. You can see this is 8.2 from SPL, even though the approach course is over here. So that's why it's in blue. Uh, this is, this uh, NDB here is just being used as a waypoint. All right, so it's a waypoint, and, and that's why the box is in black. It's not primary to the approach. It's just a waypoint along the approach. And then you've got two VORs here. I could not possibly even try to name that VOR. Uh, but this VOR here, this is a transition VOR, and that's why you see this line going off the plan view there. Um, and that's pretty much the gist of your frequencies there. They're usually right in front of your face. I miss them sometimes too. Uh, but your primary frequency is usually going to be in a big bold box. And then any other frequencies that are critical to the approach, like the Phoenix VOR, are usually on the newer Jeppesen charts, are usually going to be in a blue box as such. All right, we're almost done with the plan view here. The last thing I want to talk about is the missed approach. So this box here along with uh, this box here 
they correlate to this right here on the plan view and it can be different depending on which uh, procedure you're looking at right so your missed approach procedures on the plan view are always going to show up with this really bold dashed line all right and what we see here so if we read this it's uh, for missed approach we climb to 5,000 feet once we reach 5,000 feet then we make a left turn direct to the Phoenix or PXR VOR and then hold or is directed by ATC and we can see what that looks like here we're climbing straight ahead on the same heading until reaching 5,000 feet now just because it turns here doesn't mean you're at 5,000 feet here this is just assuming that you continue straight out on your climb until you reach 5,000 feet once you do that you make this left turn inbound directly to the Phoenix VOR and then you can see in this thin line here it shows you the holding pattern okay so unless otherwise directed by ATC this is what you're going to be doing is flying a little circle over here if you go over here to the ILS on uh, in uh, Shipple you can see that it's straight ahead right so it says climb on track 058 that was our final approach course uh, at to 2,000 feet and then inform ATC it doesn't tell you to do anything else ATC is going to give you directions from there all right I think I meant I, I I'm pretty sure I mentioned it but if I didn't the uh, final approach course is always going to be in big bold uh, lettering like this or numbers like this so zero seven eight degrees big bold letters going to be somewhere near either either near the initial approach fix or you might have a final approach fix FAF I haven't seen those much lately but if you have a final approach fix it's going to be on there um, and it just tells you the the inbound course uh, for the approach and then again for the missed approach you can see it's uh, depicted here dashed line same thing here so for missed approach it's climbed to 5,000 feet direct to Uxun right now see this little box here it's because Uxun doesn't appear on this plan view all right now keep in mind uh, like I said before these waypoints they're just arbitrary waypoints that somebody put there I'm sure they're measured they're, they're put at specific distances but the distances aren't provided all right so you're gonna climb straight ahead 5,000 feet direct to Uxun and then via the 111 degree track okay inbound to the IWA VOR it's the Willie VOR IWA is actually the identifier for Mesa Gateway Airport which is right next to that VOR so you'll fly 111 degrees out to that VOR and then you would hold there and that gives us that follows all the directions there so you can see once again it's that dark that uh, bold dashed line and then if all the information isn't provided here in the plan view then it gives you this little inset here um, which is same thing here missed approach hold right so I had it down just a little bit uh, so that we could see those boxes up there um, but this is the alternate missed approach hold now it doesn't say anything up here about going to the IWA VOR does it but there might be a reason or maybe as directed by ATC where you'd go to this alter, alternate missed approach hold so they might uh, ATC might tell you you know hey uh, go ahead and uh, uh, head direct to the IWA VOR and hold and so you would go out there and that be your alternate missed approach hold okay now we're about to talk about the profile view but before we do we can't overlook this box right here this is the non-precision recommended altitude descent table what does that mean remember we said that this is an ILS or a localizer DME approach to runway 7 left what that means is if the glide slope or is out the ILS right we can still fly with the localizer if it's working but if we do that we need to have a descent profile and it's not going to measure up with this because it's just not they're not always going to be the same right so if we're flying this just as a localizer DME approach then here's the information we need for that at now this is IPHX DME <clears throat> remember IPHX is our localizer it has distance measuring equipment so when we are six nautical miles from the IPHX localizer we should be at 2480 feet now these altitudes are going to be MSL not AGL when we are five nautical miles out we should be at 2160 feet at four nautical miles 1840 and at three nautical miles 1520 and by then we're getting close to our decision altitude for an ILS approach anyway and we should be able to see the runway and if we can't then we're probably gonna have to perform a missed approach 
Okay, so this is another little add-in edit here. We're talking about this non-precision altitude table here, and I just started, and I just got done talking about the missed approach. Uh, but what I didn't include there, even though we talk about it a little later, is this box down here. All right, and this has to do with your uh, descent angle, and you can see it's an ILS glide slope or localizer descent angle, and it's related to your speeds and your rate of descent. Now, I do discuss this a little bit in depth. Uh, a little later on in the video but I just wanted to come on here real quick and let you know that these two correlate with each other as well alright so meeting these altitudes using these speeds and these descent rates should work out just fine and then as far as the missed approach is concerned the missed approach point is at Surla right so uh, you can continue on this descent all the way to Surla but you can see here with the dotted lines that you should not descend below uh, this altitude here and the only thing I don't like is it's not really telling me what the altitude is um, but either way the the point being that you can descend all the way to Surla as long as you're meeting uh, the minimums for a localizer glide slope out here right so we'll talk about this in depth later I'm not going to go into it right now for this little edit but just know that this box and this box correlate with each other and then of course when you think about it everything on the approach chart really goes together because you need the minimums as well if you're flying a, uh, a non-precision DME approach all right, let's get back to what we were talking about. Okay, so with that in mind, I want to move to the profile view, but I do just want to stress that you won't see this box on every chart. For example, it is not on this GPS approach. It is on the ILS approach into Shiphole, and it is also on the RMP approach into Shiphole. And the information typically will be the same. You might see it's a few variances in there, uh, but overall, it's pretty straightforward information. It's uh, set distance from a specific uh, fixed point that you can measure with your radio equipment and then an altitude based on that distance. Now let's look at the profile view so that we can uh, get down to the bottom of this thing and start wrapping this up. Profile view is pretty straightforward. We can compare this with both the briefing strip and the plan view to make sure we understand what we're looking at. We know at foul we were 11 nautical miles out from the localizer IPHX. We see that here as well. And this tells us that at foul we should be at 4,000 feet. This line here tells us two things. One, that we should be at 078 degrees and that we should also be descending from 4,000 feet down to 2,600 feet as we cross foul. So we must cross foul at 4,000 feet. We should be at 2,600 feet by the time we reach Zynga. Either way, we got about four and a half miles to make that descent, which should be plenty of time if we're not going too fast, right? Then remember that Zynga, if we go back up here to our briefing strip, Zynga was our glide slope intercept point. It was 2,600 feet MSL or above sea level or 1,484 feet AGL or above ground level. And we can see here we only get the MSL uh, altitude here, 2,600 feet, and this little star or asterisk tells us that that is our glide slope intercept. And it even tells us here, it gives us even more information. Zynga 6.4 from IPHX, same as here, but it also tells us glide slope 2600 feet. That's referring to this back up here saying this is where you should be intercepting the glide slope. And then we've got our glide path, which we see the little uh, feather up here. It's kind of the same thing here. It doesn't, the feather is just to tell you that this is basically the path you should be on. Um, some of them will be bigger, some of them will be longer, some of them will be shorter. In the end, you want to be at 078 degrees, headed straight towards the runway and intercept the glide slope here. So if you're on the localizer, you can't fly this as an ILS unless you're flying along the localizer. And if the glide slope uh, equipment is working, then you would intercept that here and you'd begin to descend. This dashed line or dotted line, this is for this non-precision approach right here. So you can see uh, now this is giving us altitude, uh, a different altitude, right? So at Perch, uh, we are, this is 1.1, we're at 1.5 nautical miles out. So this is inside of what we're seeing here. Now I don't know why it's set up that way, uh, but you could descend using this as well. So from Zynga, we can descend all the way down to 1,620 feet before we reach Perch, but we can't go below that. All right, now this is if we don't have an active glide slope. If we come over here to our RNAV approach, it's not really any different except that we don't have uh, a, glide a piece of glide slope equipment that actually guides the aircraft along the glide slope. We use VNAV instead. 
So we would come in at 4,000 feet at up new out here, and then on the same track, 078, we'd descend to 3,000 at Yexi, Yexi, however you say that, and then it looks like a glide slope intercept, and in a sense it is, but it's actually just a glide path intercept. All right, so this is the point where we want to start descending continuously towards the runway. And then you can see you've also got three missed approach points on here. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And then here again, same thing. This approach uh, we saw earlier, it comes out over the NDB, and then it makes this big wide turn here to circle back around, and that's going to line us up for the runway. And that's why you see this line up here. This is representing this turn right here and then you come around and then it's an intercept for the glide slope at 058 degrees 6.2 nautical miles out from KAG on the RNP approach again I've never even I've never even heard of one of these approaches so I didn't have any time to look into this really um, maybe I'll do that on a more advanced tutorial but ultimately the information is relatively the same out here at Osron you're at 2000 feet 058 degrees to EH609 all right, and then you would begin a continuous descent from there to the runway and we have glide path information here it's telling you three degrees and if your ground speed is 120 knots you should be descending at 637 feet per minute that's that's a three degree glide slope all right in the larger aircraft our ground speed at 2000 feet is probably somewhere between 140 and 160 so you do what's called interpolating so you would take the difference between the two so let's say we were at 150 right well what's the difference between these two here 743 and 849 is a difference of 105 knots what's half of 105 is going to be 52.5 right so it would be 743 plus 52.5 is uh, 795.5 so just shy of 800 feet per minute if you were at 150 knots ground speed and all of these are going to have that as well same thing here this is a three degree glide slope so notice that the numbers are the same 637 at 120 743 at 140 and so on okay same thing here three degree glide slope 637 743 849 oh and look at that three degree glide slope in fact a three degree glide slope is the most common glide slope that you're going to come across almost all approaches and i stress almost all approaches are going to be a three degree glide slope but there are some that most certainly are not a three degree glide slope a good example would be london city that is a pretty steep approach i don't know what the uh... identifier is i don't know if i could pull it up by typing in london city let's see london city let's see if it'll pull up the charts for that eglc london city if we look at the approach here um, let's just do the DME runway 27 to minimums nope that's not a chart so we can see on here that the glide slope is 5.5 degrees it's a steep approach in there so when we look at the profile view it doesn't look any different than it did on any of these but it's actually a 5.5 degree uh, descent angle so at uh, on this um, ILS uh, runway 7 approach here a 3 degree glide slope at 120 knots is 637 feet per minute right but on this approach at 120 knots it's 1170 feet per minute you see the difference there alright so that's why that glide slope information is provided there for you and it's for the non-precision portion of the approach if you're flying a non-precision approach you don't need this if you're on a if you're on a uh, an instrument glide slope for uh, ILS because the aircraft and the the equipment on the aircraft and on the ground are flying the glide slope for you. All right, but if you're flying this just as a non-precision approach localizer with the glide slope out, it's going to be a 5.50 degree angle. So you can see the difference there. Let's go back over to this approach chart. Uh, and that's pretty much the gist of the profile view. It does give you the missed approach point here. So note that the missed approach point is a little bit higher if you're flying non-precision approach, right? So 1,520 feet is going to be the missed approach point. So if I get here, uh, basically this is telling me if I get uh, inside of one nautical mile from the runway, and I may be interpreting this a little wrong, so if I am, please say so down in the comments so we can get it squared away. But my understanding, if I'm within one nautical mile, of the runway and I cannot see the runway then I'm going to perform a missed approach however if I'm on the glide slope 
uh, using the ILS, not glide slope out, but actual precision approach, then I can go down just a little bit lower to my decision altitude of 1,326 feet. If I can't see the runway at this point, then I need to perform a missed approach. All right, and uh, that's going to take us to the next section. I was going to pause the video, but I think I'll just continue on from here. So uh, we're, we're still on the same section here, but we're talking about missed approach now. All right, so we do have a little bit more information down here. First of all, we've got our runway lighting in this box right next to our non-precision approach information. We've got our runway lighting. In this case, we've got Pappy lights on the left-hand side, and we've got Mauser lights. Now, I've had such a tough time with these, uh, but I'm starting to get it here. So Mauser lights are medium-intensity approach lights with runway alignment indicators. That's what that Mauser stands for, and it's basically just telling you the configuration of the lights going in. Next to that, we have basically what I call our pictogram. It's a picture form of the missed approach procedure, and basically the idea here is if I didn't memorize this, which I probably didn't anyway, and I have to go, I'm flying a missed approach right now, I don't want to sit here and try and read this, I want to see what do I do, right? So what is step one? Step one is to climb straight ahead to 5,000 feet. So I can glance at my chart real quick and say, okay, we're going straight ahead to 5,000 feet. Now once I start to get established in the climb, I get the aircraft cleaned up, I see left turn. Well, I know that it's at 5,000 feet, so I can make the left turn, and then it tells me direct to PXR and gives me the frequency. And that's all exactly the same as what you see here, and it's the same as what you see here. So you can tell that understanding and knowing what the missed approach is is pretty darn important. And the information is going to be the same no matter which, uh, which approach chart you're looking at. So here it's going to be the Mal Mauser lights again because it's the same runway, just a different approach. And then here it's climb straight ahead to 5,000 feet direct to Uxcun. Right, and remember how that was, and then Uxcun is out here, it's off the chart, so they put the little box here, and then from there, it doesn't give us any more information, but that's all right, because Uxcun is obviously gonna be out here a little ways, gives us a little time to get ourselves settled, and then we can go up here and we can say, okay, then it's the 111 degree track to the IWA VOR. Okay, so I'm going to edit this little portion in here. I actually just cut out a huge section right here because as I was talking about these uh, approach lighting systems, I went over here to this uh, chart in Shipple and you can see that it's got an HIALS2 approach lighting system. And I started stumbling and bumbling my way through. I actually was uh, trying to search it up on Google while recording the video. And when it's all said and done, I still can't find anything that actually says what this stands for. Now that doesn't mean that nothing exists, it just means that I'm not finding it for whatever reason. In fact, every time I type this in, I get all of the other uh, lighting configuration acronyms and their meanings, but I don't ever get this one. So, here's what I believe it means. High Intensity Approach Lighting System 2. Okay, I'm pretty positive that's what H-I-A-L-S means because A-L-S is approach lighting system. It's most likely that H-I means high intensity and then we got our Pappy lights obviously on the left hand side. Now why does the lighting, the runway lighting or approach lighting always appear next to the missed approach information? Because the runway lighting is related to your minimums and whether or not you have to fly a missed approach. So for example, if I'm still in um, that last little layer of clouds at 200 feet, but I can clearly see the runway approach lighting, then I, I'm fine. I can continue the approach because I can visually see where I'm at. But if I can't see that lighting, then I can't continue the approach, right? Depending on what the minimums are and so on. So that's why the lighting is always going to appear next to the missed approach information in the uh, what I call the pictogram or the pictograph here. Right? So it's important to understand what lighting you're actually looking for. Now there's a bunch of them out there and, uh, and in Europe they're, they're labeled differently but I think that ultimately they're the same lighting systems. I'm not 100% positive on that and so somebody from Europe, if you've got more information on this, please let me know. But real quick, I'm going to go, I'm going to literally go right through these and here I'm going to show you this picture right here popping it up there it is and you can see the different configurations of the approach lighting here all right and, and basically this is just showing you how they're laid out right so you can find several pictures like this online and this shows you 
what what the lighting configuration should look like when you come on to approach so the ALS F2 is going to have the red lights on the sides and so on and so forth and then you can find a description of what all what all of these lights are supposed to look like like a text description of what they're supposed to look like on this little picture right here you can see that a triangle represents a flashing white light a circle a little white circle means a steady burning white light steady green steady red and then there's an omnidirectional flashing light for like the odols here all right so but you're looking at these or you see these on a chart and you think to yourself you know what the heck does that mean what am i looking at so i'm going to go down a list here real quick and i'm going to read these off to you all right, while you're looking at the picture here, now there's all the ones on the picture, I believe, are here, and there's a couple maybe that are not on the picture. So you have Mauser, which is medium intensity approach lighting system with runway, runway alignment indicator lights. And I've talked about these before in a previous tutorial. You have MALS F, which is medium intensity approach lighting system with sequence flashing lights. Then you have SALS, which is a short approach lighting system. You have uh, S. SALS, which is a simplified short approach lighting system. Then you have SALR, S S A L R, which is simplified short approach lighting system with runway alignment indicator lights. <laughs> All right, and you can see that uh, both of those are on there, and the Mauser is pretty much the same as the SALR and so on. Okay, and then you've got the uh, S S A L F, which is the simplified short approach lighting system with sequence flashing lights. Then you've got the O dolls, which you see in the bottom right corner there, or the bottom right picture, and that's the omnidirectional approach lighting system. Then you've got A L S F one, which you see on the bottom left, and that's your approach lighting system with sequence flashing lights configuration one and then ALS F2 is the same thing but configuration two and you can see that the configuration is different on those so for the most part they're relatively the same uh, it really has to do with uh, well no they're really just not the same they're they're different different configurations but they're both approach lighting systems with sequence flashing lights alright and then uh, what you don't see on here is you've got uh, Calvert, oh, wait a minute, holy guacamole, I've been looking everywhere and all of a sudden I just found it. The, you've got the Calvert um, 1 ICAO 1 HIALS ICAO compliant configuration 1 high intensity approach lighting system. So I was right, it's high intensity approach lighting system. Um, the one we're looking at, the one we're looking at on the Schiphol chart is configuration 2. Uh, so you've got configuration 1 and 2. So that's the Calvert. Uh, ICAO HIALS or ICAO compliant configuration 2 high intensity approach lighting system. Wow, I've been looking everywhere for that and I finally found it. So there you have it. At least I'm not stumbling through it anymore. Uh, then you've got LDIN, which is a lead in lighting. You've got REIL, which is runway end identification lights. <clears throat> and then you've got uh, RAIL, which is runway alignment indicator lights and we're actually going to be talking about RAIL uh, a little bit later in our tutorial when we're talking about minimums so um, I wanted to come on here with this new edit I know it's long but it was driving me absolutely crazy and I think it's imperative that you understand at least what the different lightings are go and take the opportunity to look it up on Google find what the configurations are you can find uh, textual descriptions or descrip uh, text descriptions of them so that you understand what, what what approach lights you should be looking for but I'm really glad that I found what HIALS stands for now back to the program alright I know it's been a long road but we finally reached the last part of our approach chart it is the minimums section or the minimums box down below you may recall when we first started out over on our ILS approach for Schiphol when we were reading our middle briefing strip it says for a cat 1, 2, 3A or 3B approach, ILS approach, refer to minimums and all the information for that is going to be down here. Now that information is going to be down here anyway uh, but because there are so many options they put it down here. Now let's go over to one that's a little easier to start with and this is the minimums for the ILS runway 7 approach into Phoenix. Now starting with this little box here that says Terps. This actually means something. I never even noticed it but it means something. This could say Terps, Standard, Military, Tailored, Jar Ops or nothing at all <laughs> which is just absolutely crazy. But for our purposes Terps actually means that these minimums comply with the United States standard for terminal instrument 
procedures. Now, if you jump back over here to our SHPL approach, it says standard. And standard indicates that the published landing minimums are compliant with European Ops 1, whatever that is. All right, so there you have it. Uh, this little box actually means something there, and it figures it would. There's no point in putting anything on there if it doesn't mean anything, right? Okay, so right here up top, we've got basic information. It's a straight-in landing for runway 7 left. It's not a uh, it's not a procedure turn or anything like that. It's a straight-in landing. Same thing here, straight-in landing. These minimums are for a straight-in landing. It doesn't mean that this turn <clears throat> suddenly isn't applicable or anything like that. It just means that the minimums apply to this straight-in portion uh, approach to the runway here. <clears throat> Another cough in your face there. All right, let's move down. We got a couple different sections here. All right, now let's start over on this side here. C and D, these are the, uh, let me find it over here real quick. It's the aircraft approach categories. And over here it says also see chart glossary. I don't really know the different categories of aircraft, or uh, aircraft approach categories. Um, that's something I was trying to look it up and I couldn't find the information. It's something you would think would be readily available. Notice all of these say, say C and D, uh, but they could say A, B, C, or D. In this case, it's just C and D. So if these, this, these minimums are applicable to these two aircraft approach categories. And if I happen to find those, I'll put a text message or something in here that says what those are. Now you can see this is for the ILS approach. Um, it's separated into two boxes. We'll get down here in a minute. But this is for an ILS approach. This means a, an absolute, you've got your instrument landing system. You've got the vertical uh, 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 navigation system. You've got the lateral navigation system, the whole shebang. And your decision altitude and height are listed here again. These are your minimums. All right. This is minimum altitudes. These are minimum visual ranges. All right, so decision altitude is 1,326 feet MSL or 210 feet AGL. We went over that earlier. That compares to this box up here, right? ILS decision altitude, it's the same exact numbers. Now, when you get to the approach like you have over here in Schiphol, because there are so many different uh, um, categories that are being listed here they just said C minimums and you go down below and you find them down there that's why it's written like that pretty straightforward now if it's a full ILS approach meaning all your lights all the lights are working everything is good to go alright then you need a runway visual range of 2400 feet these are in hundreds of feet so that's 4000 feet 3000 feet 5500 feet or one half statute mile now Anytime there's a note related to that specific minimum section, it'll be uh, there will be a number in there like this. So in this case, uh, you can have a runway visual range of 1,800 feet. Remember, these are minimums. Minimum run runway visual range of 1,800 feet with the flight director or autopilot or HUD to decision altitude. So what that's saying is if I'm using the flight director, or the autopilot or I'm flying with a HUD I can fly all the way down to 210 feet and if I have 1800 feet of runway visual range or more at 210 feet I'm still good if I'm not using these if I'm just flying it by hand no flight director no autopilot no HUD then I need 2400 feet of runway visual range or one half statute mile okay now I'll jump over here real quick and I have to grab this guy up here what is RAIL or ALS out mean? RAIL is runway alignment indicator lights and ALS is approach light system. If either or both of those are out, you can still fly this approach down to these minimums. But when you reach these minimums, you must have a runway visual range of 4,000 feet or three quarters of a statute mile. That's what that means right there. Now let's jump over to this next section here. This is the localizer only approach with the glide slope being out. This means I'm using the localizer for lateral navigation, but I do not have vertical navigation from an instrument system. So I'm flying that either based off of this chart here or some other means uh, using my distance measuring equipment and so on, right? And we can do that. We can use our glide slope out, distance measuring equipment. We're using these altitudes here. This tells us that our minimum decision altitude is 1,460 feet. 
that's MSL or above sea level, or it's 344 feet AGL. All right. Now, with the whole lighting, with the full lighting system, it doesn't say full, but it, I think it should. You you need at this altitude, you need a runway visual range of 3,000 feet or five eighths of a statute mile. If your runway alignment indicator lights or your approach lighting system or both are out, you must have a runway visual range of 5,500 feet or one statute mile. All right. And then coming over here, we still have one more box, circle to land. If you're performing a circle to land, um, you would have some different minimum altitudes and you have some maximum speeds. I don't know what the C means. I can't find the information on that anywhere. I've got all this information, I mean tons of information on this stuff, and it even talks about the circle to land here, but it doesn't say anything about the C on there. It just sort of the information just sort of peters out and then it goes end of approach chart legend and then on it goes to other information I can't find what the C means here so I apologize for that if I figure it out again I'll put a uh, text comment on here but anyway if you're gonna fly this approach with a circle to land approach this is straight in landing for runway 7 left if we're gonna circle to land we have a max speed of 140 knots our minimum decision altitude would be 2040 feet or 905 feet AGL and we would need a minimum of two and three quarters of a statute mile runway visibility in order to land. If our max speed was at 165 knots then our minimum decision altitude is 2,560 feet or 1,425 feet AGL and we need a minimum of three statute miles of runway visual range. All right, so I hope all that makes sense to you. Now, let's jump over and look at a couple other charts real quick. LPV is a, okay, it's a localizer performance with vertical guidance. It's, a, it's the highest precision GPS aviation instrument approach uh, available without specialized air crew training requirements such as a RNP or required navigation performance approach. Notice we've got one of those over here. This is an RNP approach. This requires, I didn't know this, this requires specialized air crew training. So I don't feel so bad about not knowing much about this approach. But for this G GPS approach, there is a, an L, if you have LPV, which is a WAS enabled GPS high precision vertical guidance with localizer performance navigation system. I, that's a lot of information. I don't even know what that is. I've never heard of it before. But if you have an LPV, here's your minimums. Now remember, this is, this is TERPS minimums, which is the United States standard for terminal instrument procedures. All right. And our decision altitude, if we're flying an LPV approach, is 1,389 feet. Notice that that is a little bit higher than the ILS approach still. 1,389 feet or 273 feet AGL. If we're flying uh, with a full, full lighting system and everything, runway visual range of 2,400 feet or a one half statute mile. If the runway alignment indicator lights or the uh, approach lighting system, and I have to keep looking at my terms over here because there's so many of them. It's absolutely ridiculous how many terms there are, right? I can't even find the, the sheet anymore. There it is. It's uh, ALS's approach light system. If those are out or one or both of those are out, then you must have a runway visual range of 4,500 feet or 7 eighths statue mile. Okay. If you're using LNAV and VNAV, your decision altitude is 1,519 feet, which is much higher, or 403 feet AGL. You need a 5,000 foot or one statute mile runway visual range. And if you don't have the approach lighting systems or runway alignment indicator lights, then you must have a runway visual range of 6,000 feet and one or one and one quarter statute mile. If you're using LNAV only, then it's 1,580 feet, 464 feet AGL, and you guys get the gist of it, all right? So with all the lights being good, it's 4,000 feet, three-quarter statute mile. Uh, I don't know why it's got two of them here. I'm assuming that it's, uh, uh, with if you're using uh, minimum decision altitude, it's this one. If you're using radio altimeter, it's this one. That's just a guess. If the lights are out, and that's nowhere on Jeppesen's uh, little thing over here either, even though it does show stacked boxes like this it doesn't explain them <laughs> like I don't get that maybe it does here let me look real quick number three visibility values uh, now that just talks about them being labeled in meters 
that yeah it did, if it's explaining it I'm not understanding it so and then again with the lights out there you go and then you have your circle to land so all of that's it's the same information it's just a little more here and it's a little different because this is a GPS approach now going over here to uh, the European side of the house it's a little bit different a cat 1 ILS is not as uh, the weather's not as bad as a cat 3 Bravo how do I know that because on a Cat 1 ILS, if I'm flying a Cat 1 ILS, my decision altitude is 189 feet uh, MSL or 200 feet AGL, right? On a Cat 3 Bravo, there's no number there because a Cat 3 Bravo is all the way to the runway with a runway visual range of 75 meters. Okay, so that's how I know a Cat 1 is basically your standard ILS. A Cat 2, the weather's getting pretty nasty. Cat 3A, it's really bad. Cat 3B, you can't see anything. All right, so <laughs> it starts with the Cat 3B. Um, I would think it would go the other way, but a Cat 3B does not have any minimums. There are no minimums for a Cat 3 Bravo approach. There is a runway visual range minimum. That's the uh, altitude minimums. There's a runway visual range minimum of 75 meters, okay, specifically meters, not feet. For a Cat 3 Alpha, you do have a decision height of 50 feet, and this notice it's 50 feet MSL. There is no AGL on this. You must use MSL. All right, and then you need a runway visual range of 200 meters. Okay, and then for an ILS Cat 2, all right, the radio altimeter of 100 feet, and that's in big bold letters. And I remember it mentioned something briefly about that being in big bold letters. Um, Oh, where did it go? There it is. Number 18 over here. Radio altimeter height associated with CAT 2 precision approaches. That's all it is. That's why it's in big bold letters because it's associated with a CAT 2 ILS. All right. Decision altitude of 89 feet MSL or 100 feet radio a uh, altimeter AGL. Runway visual range of 300 meters. For a CAT 1 ILS, it's 189 feet MSL, 200 feet AGL. All right, with all your light systems good to go, uh, runway visual range of 550 meters. If your touchdown zone, this is lightings again, right? So in Europe, they tend to have light lighting systems in the touchdown zone on the actual runway. Uh, I don't know what CL is. Um, and I didn't see that over here either. And I'm just looking real quick to see if it shows up. But of course it's not going to because I don't think Jeppesen did a very good job with this, to be quite frank with you. Um, so if you know what CL means in this case, the touchdown zone lighting or CL lighting, uh, I'm trying to think what CL might stand for, but it's just not coming to mind. If either of those is out, though, you still it shows runway visual range of 550 meters, but it's got a note here. Note here says runway visual range 750 meters when a flight director autopilot or HUD to decision altitude is not used. So in other words, if you're using a flight director, autopilot, or HUD, you can fly down to five, uh, you can use a runway visual range of 550 meters. If you're not using them, then it's 750 meters. There we have it. And then if the ALS is out, that's the uh, 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 approach lighting system. For goodness sakes, there's so many acronyms I can barely remember. Uh, then the runway visual range must be 1,200 meters. And then here, again, if you're using just the localizer, glide slope is out, which means we're using our glide slope out localizer um, uh, chart here. I forget the name of that now. Um, then we can, then these are our minimums here. So CDFA, I have no idea what CDFA is. I don't, I didn't see that anywhere else on here. And I haven't seen CDFA written anywhere on here. Is it on here? CTAF, no. CDFA is not on here either. It's <laughs> killing me with these acronyms. I have no idea what CDFA is. If you know what that is or if I figure it out, I'll put it in text. Otherwise, please tell me down in the comments. Uh, decision altitude 410 feet or 421 feet if you're using radio altimeter AGL. Uh, runway visual range is 1300 meters. If the approach lighting system is out, then it's 2000 meters. Notice that the number two doesn't appear anywhere down here except on circle to land. But there's a number two up here. I didn't even talk about it. Um, do not descend below the descent profile. Uh, that's a critical note there. And I should have noted that earlier. When you see these little circles with numbers, uh, it's it's basically a message, right? So uh, the number one 
and the only place I see it is right there and it doesn't just says 34 nautical miles to VOR flight level 70 so I'm assuming then then that's the information for number one but this says number two it doesn't give any information that's down here same thing down here you got number one number one and then number two is on circle to land it says to runway 18 left and 36 left not permitted except in case of emergency so you cannot fly a circle to land to either of those two runways unless you have an emergency uh, <clears throat> but if we're flying it to runway six uh, if we're flying at 180 knots this uh, minimum decision altitude 880 feet uh, or 891 feet AGL notice that the AGL is higher on a couple of these on all of these actually um, and then uh, runway vis visual range 2400 meters and then at 205 knots it's 900 feet or 911 feet 3600 meters and then real quick we're just gonna glance at this very briefly because uh, and I'm really glad to find out that an RNP approach requires specialized training because I was like man I haven't even heard of one of those I pulled it up because I thought well let's see what it's all about and this thing is just crazy I don't know what all of this means I'm assuming this means for a category C aircraft this means for a category D that would make sense to me so it gives us different decision altitudes and heights for the two different categories we did look at what LPV meant and I'll pull it up over here again just so that I can refresh my own memory it means uh, localizer performance with vertical guidance it's the highest precision GPS WAS which is WAAS enabled aviation instrument approach procedure currently available without specialized aircrew training requirements such as those required by uh, such as those for required navigation or RNP performance which is what this procedure is so if you're flying it as an LPV here's your minimums there and I'm not going to read them all again um, but if you're flying it as LNAV VNAV then you've got some different minimums over here LNAV and there, there's that CDFA again uh, no idea what that means I'll try one more look up here uh, while I'm doing the video <laughs> it's driving me nuts on an approach plate there's just so many things CDFA is a technique consistent with stabilized approach procedures for flying the final approach segment of a non precision approach procedure is a constant descent without level off from an altitude at or above the final approach fixed altitude to a point approximately 15 meters or 50 feet above the landing that's what CDFA is it doesn't actually say what the act oh it's continuous descent final approach so CDFA is continuous descent final approach these would be your minimums there there I'm glad I looked that up because now I know and now you know as well um, and then circle to land procedures over here and that is it ladies and gentlemen oh I do want to note that pan ops means something as well I saw that on here let me pull that up really quick holy cow it's just crazy how many different things there are it has to do it's similar to terps uh, the terps or pan ops designator in the lower left margin describes the criteria used for the design of the approach itself so pan ops has to do with the criteria used for the approach that was a ton of information I know it was a long video I do apologize for that but I wanted to make sure I got everything I hope that I laid out the chapters really well so that you guys got the uh, absolute best use out of the video and you got the most information possible I think that this one though it is very long and detailed is a redeeming video considering my last approach chart video really just wasn't that great I do appreciate you guys taking the time to watch it. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, moans, groans, or complaints, please leave them down in the comments section down below. If you haven't already done so, I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to get up to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Also, hit the thumbs up button. Let me know that you liked the video if you did. That lets me know that I did a good job here, and I sure would appreciate that. And if you didn't like it, you can give it a thumbs down. But please, give me some type of constructive criticism nicely down in the comments section so that I can do a better job in the future and if I got something wrong by all means please put it down in the comments so that anybody else who watches this video has an opportunity to learn as well that's it that's all ladies and gentlemen and it was a whole lot until next time as always keep the blue side up unless otherwise instructed by ATC God bless you all I love you guys and I thank you for all of your support have a fantastic day <laughs>
Five, you're taking the Cessna's 11 o'clock, two and a half miles, slightly higher.